Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Danny Levine, and I am a professor at the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa. Thank you for joining me. We have all experienced over a year of lockdown teaching, mostly online. It's now time to take stock of the lessons that we've learned and plan for the future, aiming to maximize the proportion of our students that achieve mastery. For the next 30 minutes, we'll discuss how PSC mastery can be taught and what are the lessons that we've learned in the COVID-19 pandemic and how they impact on this objective. Process Systems Engineering aims to harness the computation to improve the design, control and operation of processing systems. Suppose a processing system leads to this product distribution, where a grade of 70% is the minimum quality required for saleable product. Clearly, not one of us would be comfortable with a production line in which a third of the production is waste. In the same way, if we were teaching a course in which this plot shows the final grade distribution, we would be equally unhappy as fully one third of our students would not have acquired mastery of the course materials. So let's first describe what we mean by mastery. And we'll do that for the capstone design course, although similar definitions could be shown for other PSC courses. To achieve mastery, a student needs to demonstrate the following capabilities. The ability to compute reliable equipment cost estimates and perform plant profitability analysis. The ability to uh, design separation sequences both for zero, zeotropic and azeotropic systems, the ability to carry out minimum energy requirement targeting and perform heat exchanger network synthesis to meet them in a plant-wide setting, the ability to conceptually design a plant-wide control system and to perform qualitative hazard, hazard and operability studies and quantitative hazard analysis, and to execute a design project in a team setting which provides a vehicle to demonstrate most of these skills. As a demonstration, consider a student team's design for this year's design project at the Technion producing 90,000 tons of DME a year. This is the reaction section of a particularly successful design that achieves a venture profit of $6.8 million per year. The methanol feed from the process is mixed with unreacted methanol recycled from the separation section, heated with intermediate pressure steam in E100, partially vaporizing the methanol, and then by heat exchange with hot reactor effluent in E101 to its ignition point. The methanol conversion is 74.2% which is the optimal value when considering the total bare modules cost of the reactor when compared with all of the solutions submitted by this year's class, shown here. Note that about half of the energy required to preheat the feed stream to the desired reactor conditions is provided by utility stream. Moving on to the separation section of the process, we note that the methanol recycle is only 84% pure, a consequence of plant optimization to maximize the venture profit. We also note that the heat recovery from the hot reactor effluent stream provides 87% and 100% of the reboiler duties of the two separation tiles respectively. This has been made possible by appropriate design of the reactor preheating stream. So this is the kind of mastery expected from our students. Now, we've been doing lockdown teaching now for three semesters, right? So let's refer to this mode of teaching as LT, lockdown teaching. So here we are at LT plus three, when Jim Novel Lovell might say, uh, here's the we've had a problem. Indeed, Houston, we've had a problem. So after three semesters of lockdown teaching, most of us are indeed teaching 100% online, forced on us by necessity, but most of the lectures are delivered synchronously on Zoom and most of the exercise or recitation sections are also delivered synchronously on Zoom by our TAs, so more lecturing, which means 
that we have blown our contact time, leaving most students as passive participants. So for the most part, we are not utilizing available technology to make learning more effective. We could be moving some or all of our lecture materials online and have students use them to prepare for active learning in our meetings. But for the most part, we are not doing that. We are lecturing. Just to drive that point home, let's analyze what happens in a typical week of lecture-based teaching. It starts with a lecture, usually delivered at the lecturer's pace, which is either too slow, but mostly too fast for most students. This is the student's first point of contact with the materials, and so very few of them will be proficient enough to ask questions, and so most of the students will passively listen. There is no way that the lecturer can gauge the level of comprehension in the class. Next, students attend an exercise session where they hear another lecture, this time from the TA, who demonstrates how he or she solves typical exercises. Sure, they were taught the materials in the lecture, but the vapor pressure of this material is low. And anyway, most of them didn't get it the first time because the lecture was delivered too fast. Consequently, like in the lecture, most of the students will be passive and very little interaction will occur with the, with the TA either. After the meeting with the lecturer and the TA, they are asked to tackle homework. And now, for the first time in the week, the students need to be active, but this time on their own. If submission of homework is compulsory, most students will indeed submit a solution, but let's face it, not all submissions will be original work, and so this will not enable a reliable estimate of their abilities. The feedback students receive on their homework will come too late to affect their learning. So, lecture-based learning is a teacher-centered rather than a student-centered activity, and for the most part, students are passive in the two opportunities for student-staff contact. It was the educator, Harry Miller, who sadly pointed out that Le lecturing is that mysterious process by means of which the contents of the notebook of the professor are transferred through the instrument of the fountain pen to the notebook of the student without passing through the mind of either. So lecturing means passive students. And as everyone knows, passive students learn less. And when do we find that out? Right after the final exam, when it's too late to fix the problem. And as pointed out by the pioneer of peer learning, Eric Mazur, just as you can't become a marathon runner by watching marathons on TV, likewise for science, you have to go through the thought processes of doing science and not just watch your instructor do it. Another take, as expressed by that nudnik, Danny Levine, would be that watching a teaching assistant demonstrating how typical exercises are solved is about as useful to students as going to the gym and watching how their gym instructor lifts weights for them. Benjamin Bloom is most recognized for his taxonomy, but he made other important contributions. For example, in 1968, he postulated the four conditions needed to achieve mastery. One, there has to be a clear definition made by the instructor of what constitutes mastery. These are best stated as learning outcomes, defining what the student needs to demonstrate as proof of this mastery. Two, the lecturer needs to provide well-organized resources focused on student needs. Our interpretation of this is that the resources need to be of two classes. The first, a set of self-paced materials that students need to cover in preparation for meetings with the course staff. And second, student-centered class activity, giving students time to practice what has been learned. The third condition is to provide assistance to students when and where they experience difficulty. And the last condition is that enough time should be provided for students to achieve mastery. This implies releasing some class time to achieve this. Another Bloom contribution, this time from 1984, analyzes the impact of types of instruction on outcomes as brought by the summative score, that is, the final examination grades. In conventional instruction, with a teacher-student ratio of 1 to 30, the scores are typically 
distributed with a relatively large dispersion, often resulting in a high great failure rate. By moving to mastery learning, that is, active student-centered learning, a less dispersed distribution is obtained with a better average performance and much lower failure rate, even with the same teacher-student ratio. Of course, moving to tutorial-based instruction, requiring a generally unsustainable teacher-student ratio of one-to-one, -one, even better results are obtained. But mastery learning is sustainable. It just requires a change in the way we teach. So here is our proposed class-tested flipping classroom paradigm. A week's activity starts with an online lecture, where at their own pace, students view a series of short video segments, each followed by a quiz question or other formative activity to cement their acquired knowledge, which counts as their homework. They prepare this in advance of the week's activities, which means that the teacher can assess their competence in advance by monitoring the online activity. Online activities that we have found particularly helpful are regular quizzes, which could be multiple choice matching or numerical type questions, what we call your turn sandwich activities, in which an open-ended exercise is defined in one video and students are requested to address the problem on their own. A sample solution is presented for comparison in the subsequent video clip. It's likely that more than one possible solution can exist, and in-class discussion later of possible alternatives is a powerful way of accelerating real learning. Or one can ask students to prepare for in-class brainstorming, beginning study and analysis of a given process situation at home in advance. All of these activities mean that students have the opportunity to really prepare for a successful class meeting, which comes next. The next step is to bring the students to the class meeting, which substitutes in-class activities for what used to be regular lectures. What we now do is first wrap up and close any issues that were observed to be problematic from observations of the students' home activities in the previous phase, but most of the class time is invested in activities that we have found to be particularly beneficial. For example, running quizzes to improve comprehension, some of them revisiting home quizzes, but some designed to expand their knowledge or to generate class discussion, getting things wrong, understanding why, and then getting them right is how one learns. But the most important component is open-ended problem solving and the resulting discussions about strategic and tactical advantages that are presented in the process. These are all examples of useful activities for class meetings. Had this precious contact time been used mostly for lecturing, it would have left very little time for them, and indeed, students learn a lot more this way. This leads to the last phase, the active tutorial, where students spend most of their time getting to grips with problem sets on their own or in teams assisted by course staff. And all this means that at every phase of the week's activities, students have optimized their time investment in the course at home. They build basic knowledge, whereas in contact time with staff, they hone this knowledge to higher levels by application and practice. These improvements are difficult to achieve in a regular class setting simply because there is insufficient time to achieve it. The extra time allows for higher level work with the students. Consider the three-week segment covering heat exchanger network synthesis in the process design course. In the seventh week, students are introduced to mare targeting and basic hen design rules with typical exercises such as computing targets using TI method and executing simple hen designs. By the eighth week, they will have learned more advanced techniques, allowing them to tackle larger scale exercises involving multiple stream splits. And by the ninth week, they will have learned to apply the methodology to real problems and learned how to implement heat integration into complete processes, as well as to use the grand composite curve to combine multiple hot and cold utilities for more profitable designs.
All these topics were taught with the same allocated time before flipping was introduced, but students did not get as far because all the class time was used for lecturing. Okay, suppose we've decided to make the investment to flip. We've recorded video segments and generated quiz questions, all of which involve significant, uh, significant investment from the point of view of the lecturer. Our students have to work more intensely too, though not necessarily investing more time. And after all that, we need to keep in mind that some problems can come up. Indeed, implementation of active learning is not easy. Rick Felder wrote exactly that 25 years ago. And here is a partial list of potential problems and solutions. Expectations should be addressed up front. The first meeting with students should not cover technical material, but rather used to explain to students what is expected of them and how they should study to make the best use of their time. It's basically flipping 101, if you will, rather than covering technical material. A teacher of a course driven by active learning is a mentor and coach and not just a transmitter of information. Investing time for coaching in classes is a valuable activity. You should listen to your students and be sympathetic to their perceived difficulties. This does not mean that standards need to be compromised. You should be patient with your students. Most of them will get to your learning objectives, especially if you don't relax your outcome requirements. And lastly, don't expect 100% success. There will always be a few diehard students who resist active methods. So a fair question would be, is all this effort worth the trouble? Well, to answer that, we need data on student engagement and performance. Exam grades are indeed a measure of outcome attainment. We've always had them, but now with online teaching, we have a lot more. For example, we have attendance records from Zoom sessions for the class meetings and active tutorials. We have records on Moodle lesson engagement time and quiz grades. And we have records on video engagement time and view frequency. A student's lesson engagement is defined as the student's viewing time of the view videos associated with a lesson divided by the running time of the same videos. Clearly, lesson engage engagement greater than unity implies multiple views of some of the lesson segments. And here is a typical distribution of lesson engagement in a class. Note that most students have LE values around one. And so, for example, comparing the 20 most engaged students with the 20 least engaged students would make a very useful comparison. We'll see that later. Okay, we're good to go. Let's analyze first student perceptions on how effectively they learned. Questionnaires were posed to the students of both the process design and the process control courses taught this year at the Technion. The main objective of the poll was to assess their perceptions on how effective aspects of the teaching approach were helpful to their learning. We'll review the responses for the process design course here, noting two things. One, 51 out of 53 students enrolled responded, which is awesome. And two, the responses for the process control course were very similar. The first six questions of the questionnaire classified students as active or passive depending on how much engagement they indicated in the three phases of the flipped approach. Online lesson, class meeting, active tutorial. And here are the distributions of the student responses in the process design course on passive participation in the three weekly phases. Basically, what percentage of the meetings that they attended? We see, for example, that about 90% of the class indicated that they watched most of the online lessons. About 60% attended most of the class meetings and 75% attended most of the active tutorials. In contrast, far fewer students participated in the weekly activities actively. Only about 15% of the students participated actively in most of the class meetings and about 60% of the class were actively engaged in problem solving for themselves in the active tutorials. Using these responses, the class was divided into a group classified as active students, 
those who attended and were actively engaged in at least 75% of the active tutorials, totaling 23 out of the 51 responders. The remaining students were considered as passive students. In the poll, we asked students about the level of confidence in their mastery after each phase in the flipping paradigm on a scale of one being low confidence and five being high confidence. And we received the following results. Here showing the results now for the process control course, course, noting that those for the process design course were similar. After the online lesson, the active confidence was under three, which indicates an ambivalent stance. After the class meeting, the average level of confidence has increased to above three, getting better, but still not earth shattering. And after the active tutorial, the average level of confidence has increased to almost four, much better. A z-test confirms that each of these three distributions are significant improvements over the previous phase, noting that the z-statistic is basically a t-test at the limit, which basically computes the dimensionless separation between the peaks of the two distributions under comparison, with the value above 2 indicating marginal improvement, above 2.5 indi indi indicating significant improvement, and above 3 indicating a highly significant improvement. Each step increases students' confidence in their mastery. Evidently, the most significant step is the active tutorial. Clearly, the active tutorial provides the most significant contribution to perceived mastery, almost four for the process control course. When we analyze distributions of responses separately for active and passive students, we found a significant difference in the average responses. So we can see that Students perceive they learn most effectively in active tutorials, and especially so if they are active themselves. The most significant component of the active tutorial is the opportunity to solve problems in cooperation with peers. When polled as a class, the effectiveness of this component was considered high, almost 4 out of 5 for the process control course. When we analyze the distribution of responses separately for active and passive students, we found a highly significant difference in the average responses. So we can say that most students consider working problems in a peer setting highly effective and even more effective by active students. Okay, so we've seen that from the student's point of view, the most effective phase of the flipped approach is the active tutorial and that active students gain more from them than do the passive ones. What about outcomes? Does active learning make a difference? I have been teaching process design at the Technion for the last 25 years. Let me share some data recorded over the last 15 years. About 10 years ago, I began to introduce active learning into my teaching. A typical final exam grade distribution in that course before switching from conventional lecture-based tutorials, remember, where the TA lifts weights for the students, to active tutorials where the students themselves lift weights, looked like this. After switching to active tutorials, this was more typical. Yes, I know that the distributions are not normally distributed. In fact, a bimodal distribution featuring two peaks would describe both of these distributions much better. It's very clear, though, that the failure rate was reduced sharply by the change in teaching method, from an average of 18% failure rate before the change to an average of 10% after the change. Let me expand on that statement. In this plot, final exam distributions are displayed for four years before the switch to active tutorials. We see four green discs, each centered on mu1, mu2 coordinates. Recalling that a bimodal distribution can be expressed in terms of a weighted sum of two normal distributions with averages of mu1 for the high-performing subset of the population and mu2 for the low performing one. A fraction P of the population has a higher performing normal distribution, uh, leaving a fraction one minus P for the low performing one. The diameters of the disks in the bubble plot are in proportion to P, the fraction of the high performing subset of the population. Clearly, a class that does better will have a high value of mu1 and either a high value of mu2 or a high value of p if mu2 is relatively low. Basically, we'd like to see great distributions either on the top right of the plot, in which case we don't care about the diameter of the disks, 
or in the lower right side of the plot, in which case the discs need to be of large diameter. Having said that, the situation before switching to Active Tutorial is on the left of the screen, meaning not so great. After switching to Active Tutorials, but before flipping, the situation improved and one can see that the center of gravity of the disks has in me indeed moved to the right. And it improved again when the course was moved to flipped format in 2015 be because even more time was available to be invested in active methods. So clearly the move was worthwhile from the point of view of the overall class performance. But not all students enrolled in a flipped course are equally active in class. How does the degree of their engagement affect performance? We saw before that the active students think they learn better, but is this perceived benefit by the students reflected in their exam results too? Here is the final grade distribution from this year's process control course. Looks reasonable from a technical standpoint, with an average of 70% and a relatively low failure rate. Now let's divide this class into two parts by lesson engagement. We will recall that the lesson engagement is the ratio of the student's viewing time divided by video running time. We'll check the effect of lesson engagement on exam grades with separate plots for the bottom 20 and top 20 engaged students. And here are the two distributions. And we see that students with a high LE have marginally higher grades than those with low LE. Evidently, just by carefully studying the online lessons, students marginally improve their exam grades. Does attendance affect grades? And by this I mean attendance of both class meetings and active tutorials. Now we'll divide this class into two parts. This time we'll see separate distributions for the bottom 20 and top 20 attendees of all meetings. And here are the two distributions, and we see that students with high attendance have significantly higher grades than those with low attendance, as indicated by the Z value over 2.5. Students' opinions indicate that active tutorials provide the most benefit to their learning. We'll check out its effect on grades. Now we divide the class into two parts, with separate distributions for the bottom 20 and top 20 um, participants of active tutorials alone. And here are the two distributions, and we see that students with high participation in active tutorials have significantly higher grades than those with low participation, as indicated by the Z value of 4.5. This extremely large value is a result of the fact that none of the 20 students that participated least in the active tutorials have scored over 80% in the final exam. So active tutorials are of great benefit to the students studying the process control course. Similar differential outcomes for active tutorial participation were obtained in the process design course shown here. And again, attendance of the active tutorials provides the most impact on exam results. And so to summarize my talk, Yes, like Rick Felder said, no one is saying that applying active methods is easy. We need to make a significant investment as lecturers and students may be resistant at first. However, I have presented evidence that applying them to teaching PSC has definite benefits regarding the degree of mastery that can be attained. And like my West said, I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. Many thanks for listening and have a great day.